Welcome everyone. It's really nice to see such a large turnout on a holiday. Thank you all for coming. And thank you in particular to our guests, Fiona Harrison and Rob Kennicott for agreeing to come and talk to us about this uh, you know, important report that they have just written. So I'm going to keep my introduction short. So Fiona Harrison is the Harold Rosen Professor of Physics at Caltech and Chair of the Division of Physics, Mathematics and Astronomy. I think everybody knows she's the PI of New Star. She has won many prizes. I'll just mention the Bruno Rossi Prize, Hans Bethe Prize. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Rob Kennicott, he's professor at the University of Arizona and also at Texas A&M. Before that, he was Plumian professor at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. And even before that, he was a professor in Arizona. In fact, we were co-faculty so many years ago, it's hard to remember, but yeah, many decades ago, he and I were on the faculty in Arizona. So Rob is a, you know, a specialist expert in galaxies, star formation. Uh, he's again won, of course, many prizes. Specifically, I'll mention the Danny Heinemann Prize, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology. He's a member of the National Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society. Now, of course, they are great astrophysicists, both of them, but they've also done this great service to our community, the astronomy field, by co-chairing the Decadal Survey on Astronomy and Astrophysics 2020. And as I'm sure everybody knows, that report was finally released last week, exactly a week ago. Uh, and probably many of us, I mean, I did, and many of you were also there for the webinar. Uh, but in any case, they have very kindly agreed to come and tell us, or at least summarize for us their uh, report, what they think is the, the week ahead, I mean, the, the, the decade ahead for astronomy, and you know, to leave enough time for questions from the audience and a discussion. So the report itself, if you haven't read it, it's called Pathways to Discovery in Astronomy and Astrophysics for the 2020s. So Fiona, Rob, take it away. And uh, yeah, we'll say roughly half an hour for your speaking, and then we'll try to keep about half an hour for discussion. It's a pleasure to, to be joining you. It'll be nicer in person, but... Um... We're now, Rob and I, quite used to Zoom. We've spent most of the last few years in Zoom meetings. And, you know, as Ramesh said, we're going to try to just really skim over a few highlights, uh, assuming that you either heard the webinar or have looked at the report to try to leave significant time, you know, for discussion and to get people's thoughts. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people worked on this survey. Um, as you know, there were science panels, six science panels, six program panels, state of the profession panel. Uh, but we wanna sort of give a special shout out to our steering committee members and the NAS staff, because the heavy lifting for us really started right at the time of the pandemic shutdown, meaning everybody was juggling their, <laughs> homeschooling and lack of daycare and, you know, learning to lecture on Zoom. So that uh, definitely slowed things down, but we, we tried hard not to compromise the quality of the product. And so really um, a lot of tremendous service by many people in the community. Rob, do you want to talk to the report structure? Yeah, just a little bit. This, I think, there are only two slides here that weren't in the briefing. So for the most part, this is gonna be an abstract of what we presented last week, but thought it might be useful just to take a pause before we get into that. Uh, to If you haven't uh, tried to digest the whole report, just a few pointers uh, to content would be particularly uh, relevant to you. Um, the whole thing, I forget, in the single space PDF, I think it's 700 plus it's a monster. Part of the reason is this time uh, we've bundled all of the panel reports, all 13 of them, with the main volume. This was done deliberately um, the, uh, because we think you know, th there, th there were vital inputs 
to the survey. Those are the groups that digested all the white papers and reported up to us. In the past, they've been bound in a separate book, usually with much lo longer reports. And uh, some, I know at the beginning of the survey, I went around the hallways trying to find a colleague who had ever read them all. And it was, you know, I had to ask a lot of people before I found anybody. So uh, we're hoping that they'll get more play there, much more compact. They're about 20 pages, most of them a piece, a state of the profession, uh, a bit longer, but because there's a lot more to write about in that report. Um, so in particular, uh, sort of addressing uh, junior researchers maybe. And if you're just starting grad school, you know, you're still unsure about what you want to work on, you're looking for a thesis topic, you know, picking the science chapters and the areas you're interested in is something I highly uh, recommend. And obviously, uh, the, the state of the profession and enabling foundation reports, those are panels that were charged for the first time for the survey. Uh, they prioritize not only the decade ahead, but of course, you know, everything that's happened, uh, the state up to, uh, before then. And then uh, uh, obviously the program panels for how the sausage was made. The other thing, the only other remark I'll make before we go on, if you uh, time is limited and you want a capsule summary of almost all the high points, look to chapter one here, Pathways from Foundations to Frontiers. Um, the, uh, uh, the executive summary is a, just a, Agency uh, Academy required 3,000 word summary. It's very brief, but the Pathways document we really tried to make self-contained, and uh, it, it, you know, together with what we tell you today, we'll give you a good overview of what we did. Uh, back to you, Fiona. Yeah, so this captures the organization of the report, and you know what we tried to do throughout uh, in thinking about the program that we were recommending in organizing our principles, our guiding principles, and then coming up with the program really was to emphasize uh, the, func the essential function of building foundations, the things, the tools that astronomers need, uh, emphasizing programs that sustain and balance science. So these are things that can be executed uh, more regularly and rapidly, uh, keeping progress going and also responding to new discoveries, which we're sure to have in the next decade. And uh, then big emphasis on preparing for future large missions and observatories on the ground to forge the frontiers. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rob. I think the next view graph is describing the structure of uh, the science, a very rich, uh, science, and we're not going to belabor uh, it in this talk, but um, just want to give you a flavor. Yeah, in terms of, uh, so we're, we're just to keep to time, we're just going to talk about science in one slide, but this is a close to half of the committee work for the survey is to set the science vision. And that all happened first, that most of that happened before COVID hit uh, with the idea that science drive uh, all of the programmatic priorities that followed. This began with a huge number of community white papers, 573. Um, they were all assigned to uh, one of six or more, one or more of six science panels. Uh, you saw them in the table of contents, topically based. And every one was read and discussed individually or as a you know part of a group in a in a panel meeting, uh, and from then on it was a process of distillation. Uh, so the the panels their reports roughly twenty single size uh, space pages apiece try to cover the breadth of their subject areas uh, and not leave a major stone unturned, uh, but for the purposes of messaging not only to our own community in the main report, but also to Congress and others, you, you have to, of course, distill the messages down into eventually into almost sound bites. Uh, so we asked each panel to come back with four key science frontier questions in their area and one a discovery area. So uh, 
uh, sorry, that should be uh, six uh, discovery errors. There were six panels. I can't do arithmetic. So 30 uh, essentially bullets, uh, topic, uh, science themes. And if you read the chapters, there's sub theme uh, questions and so on. Then there were uh, two further distillations. In the main report, we found that all 30 of those priorities could be fit very nicely under one of three umbrella themes worlds and suns in context, new messengers and new physics, and cosmic ecosystems. And chapter two of the report develops those themes, uh, sort of written in a with a sort of a grad student again, you know, audience in mind. And then finally, uh, we also decided to identify for each of those themes, one priority science area, pathways to habitable worlds, new windows in the dynamic universe and unveiling the drivers of galaxy growth. Uh, the idea there, uh, uh, taking the subset of science in each theme that were the primary drivers of the program, especially the major programmatic investments that we were recommending. And also uh, in language, we hope uh, can be readily understandable on the Hill or you know you could explain to your neighbor you know in the driveway while shoveling snow, uh, sort of thing. The last point to make on that is, uh, by its very nature, those three themes and priority sciences, of course, are not comprehensive. They can't cover the whole richness. They underplay the richness of all the science in the report. Uh, but for those, if you go to chapter two and of course the panel reports themselves, uh, you will get it all. And so since most of you heard about those themes on Thursday, we'll move on. Yeah, and so we're just gonna do a very brief overview of the foundational activities, both from the State of the Profession panel and the Enabling Foundations panel. I think this was the first survey that, that had both. And you know, more than half of our recommendations are in these foundational areas. Um, Rob will remember the number, I always forget. But at any rate, uh, so we're, this very brief discussion doesn't do them justice. But from the state of the profession, these are the broad areas where we made recommendations. The first being the need to, for the agencies to collect and release demographic data. Um, then diversity of the profession, I think we all know that at the entry level, it's getting better for representation of women, but it's still, you know, very lacking in um, underrepresented minority participation. Uh, but even gender uh, balance at the higher levels uh, is still pretty, pretty lacking, uh, especially in project and mission teams. It was a white paper. Uh, I think Joan Central is the author that goes through the numbers. Um, so we have some targeted uh, advice for the agencies on how to improve on that. And then the bridge programs we were just talking about before we uh, started the presentation have really proven to be effective. I think you all know this at Harvard because you uh, have the Banneker Institute and. Um, you know, really giving underrepresented groups, uh, both in terms of racial uh, underrepresentation, low socioeconomic status, uh, the opportunities to prepare to enter a graduate program uh, is really successful. And also undergraduate and graduate traineeship programs. Uh, related to harassment and discrimination, um, you know, that's really, I think the last uh, few years have brought into pretty stark relief that this is an ongoing issue uh, in, in our profession, also um, bullying. And, you know, we really feel that policies related to harassment and discrimination need to be elevated to the same level of attention as, for example, research misconduct. The community relations, um, 
discussion in the main report and the uh, panel report really focuses on the fact that you know we build telescopes in sites that have great cult cultural sensitivity on the top of mountains and also in the example of Puerto Rico at a site where you know the Arecibo Observatory became very important to the local community and so there's advice on how to build a community oriented model um, it's really more a uh, advice for uh, professional societies. And then uh, a section on dark skies, you know, brought into recent urgency by the SpaceX launches and protecting the radio frequency spectrum. This is, I'm sure you're all aware, is uh, area, areas of very high activity. There are committees and we just wanted to, you know, it's a very fastly, rapidly evolving topic and we wanted to basically encourage the kinds of activities that are going on. So Rob, do you want to? Yeah, so I'll give you a similar summary uh, of the research foundations with the same apology that Fiona gave. We're only touching on a few highlights so we finish on time and you can of course follow up on anything uh, in the Q&A later. Um, but uh, a big overarching theme of the whole report was uh, the need to balance the investment portfolio, uh, not just building great big missions and projects in the ground and space, but make sure you support the people and the uh, fundamental uh, scientific activities like theory and so on, which you know allow us to maximize the scientific return from those facilities. So. Uh, Probably the top recommendation here was a recommendation of an augmentation to the NSF Astronomy Astrophysics Grants Program. Oversubscription in that program has continued to worsen over the last couple decades. It once was three to one over time scales. I remember 20 years ago. Now five, six to one is not uncommon for complicated reasons. Our field is growing. Uh, you know, the astronomy budget has share of the NSF budget has grown, so on. Any case, uh, we've made that recommendation. The uh, the thirty percent comes from consider it. It would meet uh, a goal set by the NSF director over the long term if they get enough funding from Congress. That's sort of a three to one over subscription, and also it's what we thought. We thought it would absorb the additional. Uh, how would you say data loads from when Ruben comes online, Dekist come online, and of course the growth in in other areas. Alma, you know, we've never even adjusted to Alma coming on and so on. Uh, likewise for NASA, the uh, theory program uh, has is now biannual competition. It also has similar oversubscriptions, and we recommend a, a similar augmentation. Uh, Report talks a lot about uh, the changing landscape of data in what we do, whether it's you know simulations and computation on the theoretical side, or machine learning, uh, huge data sets, survey data sets, the need to correlate across wavelengths and platforms, and so on. Uh, a number of recommendations, most addressing the infrastructure, uh, one to incentivize archiving of data from uh, ground-based, uh, mainly OIR observatories. Another to kind of continue the job begun with the virtual observatory in facilitating uh, follow-up, uh, essentially being able to do data discovery and correlation of measurements across the electromagnetic spectrum uh, in data sets that reside in different centers and so on not a, 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 a virtual observatory too, but something more focused, a bit less ambitious, but, and hopefully to do it quickly. And then we address laboratory astro, something I know of great interest at CFA, not just the funding level, but uh, perhaps some better coordination and prioritization of what's done and some boosts to uh, technology development, which I won't dwell on further. Go ahead, Fiona. 
Yeah, so I'm not gonna I'm spend 30 seconds on this. Uh, amazing program ahead of us in the next decade with ground and space observatories that are coming online. And, you know, we found these all to, you know, promise fabulous uh, scientific returns and really wanted to emphasize to the agencies that these need to be completed and fully supported for baseline operations and science. So I'm going to go through the space program uh, quickly. Uh, this is it in a nutshell. We, unlike previous surveys, divided into enabling and realizing large strategic missions and sustaining programs that it's, you know, roughly comparable to the medium and large scale uh, division in, of previous surveys, but really emphasizing the value of the activity to the overall program. So we don't recommend implementing a large strategic mission right away. Rather, what uh, we do is establish a mission and technology maturation program that I'll talk about. And then on the uh, ground, I mean, uh, the sustaining programs, we have two, a time domain astrophysics program, and then a competed line of probe missions uh, with areas identified uh, by the decadals. So this view graph is intended to capture uh, succinctly the reasoning behind this uh, recommendation. So if we look at uh, for the younger beginning graduate students in the audience, you may not know the history of NASA's great observatories, but there was an amazing 13 years that saw the launch of four tremendous capabilities covering the electromagnetic spectrum. And if you would draw your attention to the right-hand column there, um, you know, these great observatories really ranged in cost from what we would consider probe scale today up to the large uh, strategic missions Hubble. And uh, then if we sort of compare, the bottom table shows the four large mission concepts that were presented to the survey. Uh, there were, for Louvoir and Habex, there were a number of different versions of those, but I'm just showing here the two that we sort of consider to be closest to the range that we thought was scientifically compelling. And you can see that they're all uh, basically pandicatal, even multi-generational uh, in nature. And we really, if you look at the science, it really calls for panchromatic capabilities spanning the spectrum. Oops. So my flash player wants me to update it. No, thanks, not right now. Uh, so that was what led to the idea that you really need to optimize, come up with a different strategy for optimizing the cadence and scale of strategic missions. And I won't go through this in detail, it's a good topic for discussion, but basically uh, we recommended that NASA establish this Great Observatories Mission and Technology Maturation Program. And it's really important to understand this is not just technology development. This is significant investment in the science teams, in the development of the architectures and the development of the technologies and not just development, development and demonstration at the needed level. Uh, and I think given the time, we have five minutes, to, we're gonna stay in half an hour. I'm not gonna go through this. If you want me to come back uh, and explain in more detail uh, the structure of this program, I'd be happy to. But uh, for maturation, the highest priority is uh, IROUV large telescope optimized for observing habitable planets and general astrophysics. And, uh, I think we have a view graph on this later, so I, I won't say much about it. And then of co-equal co priority, a far infrared spectroscopy and or imaging mission and a high spatial and spectral uh, resolution X-ray strategic mission. And we set cost targets for these. That's an important um, point. 
between three and five billion is what we thought was appropriate for these capabilities uh, to achieve them in the time scales that uh, are really optimal. And then these towards the middle of the uh, decade would enter with significant investments in this maturation. And I see we have a hand up. Should we, we can certainly take questions as we go. No, I think you should continue, Fiona. Let's finish the presentation, okay. then I will call for questions. Okay, all right. Mark, okay. I think you have your hand up. Yeah, so I'll just quickly say, um, we didn't pick one of the Louvre concepts or one of the Habex concepts because we felt the sweet spot was really in between. And so we recommended a, uh, six meter off axis inscribed diameter is roughly, that's the target, sets the target for the collecting area and the scope with contrast of uh, you know, 10 to the 10. And this would provide in our estimation, a robust uh, sample of exoplanets. And this, you know, the scientific goals, this would be fantastic for general astrophysics as well as exoplanets. and as a potential to change the way that we view our place in the universe. And NASA really is the only space agency in the world that can do this. Quickly, the uh, sustaining time domain astrophysics program is envisioned to be a set of smaller missions that are competed. However, based on advice from a standing committee on what the most crucial capabilities are so that we can continue this golden age of time domain that we're in now and capitalize on upgrades of, of LIGO, Virgo uh, coming online of Rubin. <clears throat> and then the second sustaining area is uh, probe missions. And the areas that we felt were the most compelling uh, this decade for um, a probe are a far IR imaging or spectroscopy probe that um, I think we felt that worldwide a huge void was left when ESA decided not to continue with the SPICA mission. And uh, because Athena will be such a tremendous capability coming online with a large area, moderate resolution spectroscopy that um, a mission to uh, complement this uh, is, is very compelling. And, and we were thinking broadly here, very broadly. It needn't be high spectral resolution, uh, grading uh, resolution, but it could be, certainly be an obvious uh, idea. And uh, or timing or band pass, uh, wouldn't necessarily have to launch commensurate with at the same time as Athena. Right, Rob, I'll let you go through the ground. Yeah, so we're going to wrap up by uh, with a summary of the ground, a very quick summary of the ground. Um, there were three major research uh, equipment facility uh, proposals out of astronomy that uh, came uh, to the survey. Uh, and uh, we would like to see actually all three of those happen, but with a priority and cadence uh, dictated by urgency and readiness of the projects. The top recommendation is uh, that the, Fiona, could you just skip, I, I forget which deck we're on because we have some. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Uh, okay. And one more, uh, just th sorry, audience, thank you. So if you go okay. backwards, I know what to talk yeah. through. Yeah, so uh, the, um, uh, so, recommend NSF, if possible, uh, by a order a quarter share in both the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is, of course, real local interest, and um, the 30-meter uh, telescope. Uh, the scientific cases are compelling. Uh, what they, they can address most of the science. The user communities are enormous. Uh, and, you know, regardless of Europe's plans, uh, there'll be a huge demand uh, for doing science on those and investing in both could conceivably give the US community sort of half a year of openly competed time on one or the other 
of uh, these. Uh, both now, there are financial uncertainties associated with the project. There's a site issue, of course, for the 30 meter telescope. Those would have to be sorted before, but we'd very much like to see that happen uh, sort of as quickly as uh, the proposals uh, can, you know, essentially the teams meet our decision rules and an, an independent committee can uh, perform a gateway review. Um, I'm going to skip the third and then do CMB third uh, sort of out of order. NGVLA is just as compelling, right? Revolutionary order of magnitude gains in discovery capability, resolution, sensitivity would supplant both Jansky VLA and VLBA. Uh, again, addresses nearly every science priority of the survey. Uh, so we would like to see it happen but can't do everything at once, of course. Uh, there, we recommend something very analogous to the maturation study that Fiona talked about for the space observatories. Uh, first, uh, do a prototype, get, do some antenna prototyping. Also, uh, review the scope against the science uh, uh, to see you know, whether there, it should be descoped or built at full, have a gateway review sometime la, uh, mid to latter half of the decade, and, uh, and then hopefully go ahead based on the recommendations of that review. So those are two major facilities. CMBS-4 is different. It's an experiment uh, to detect B-mode uh, polarization from the ground, which would be you know, evidence for cosmic inflation, you know, primordial gravitational waves, potentially a Nobel Prize there, but also the southern, they would make a uh, map half the southern sky between a millimeter and a centimeter. And as with Planck before from space, those data have tremendous value uh, for just virtually every uh, field of astrophysics. And so on those bases, uh, we'd like to see the NSF and DOE in a 4060 partnership is what was proposed. Go ahead with that. Um, so those are the priorities. There's only one sustaining program in the survey, and that is to double down on a mid-scale. Uh, and mid-scale was recommended in 2010. This covers projects from a few million dollars funded out of the astronomy program up to 120, 130 funded in an NSF wide mid-scale. We received lots of uh, uh, very exciting uh, proposals there. We recommend they be competed in strategic areas that we could talk about in the Q&A if you like. And finally, we've uh, uh, given endorsements uh, for two projects whose prioritization would have to be set in various levels of physics reviews, um, technology development for future gravitational wave observatories, and an upgrade to the Ice Cube uh, Neutrino Observatory at the South Pole. Uh, those are uh, uh, obviously the gravitational wave observatories have a transformational value for astrophysics. Uh, the high energy neutrino observatory uh, does a lot more than astrophysics, but there's a strong astrophysics case as part of it. Okay, next. Uh, this uh, may want to focus in discussion. It's simply we've addressed in a very direct way a challenge of all these projects, and that is over time, if you look at the slope of that green line in the plot, every time we build a new major facility, of course, once it once it starts operating, there's a cost associated with operating it. And due to our own successes, uh, the fraction of the AST budget that is going to those is growing and is increasingly squeezing everything else, grants, mid-scale, uh, all the uh, foundational activities we talked about. And so an overarching decision rule is we've asked the foundation when they're uh, proposing a major facility to uh, con include consideration of where the operating dollars will come from downstream as part of that. And this is something they talked to us at the very, about it. Very, they're very much aware of this problem, but we want to put out a marker uh, that it has to be dealt with in a serious way. Fiona, why don't you take us out from there? Okay, yeah, so just quickly, this is a good 
as Rob indicated, a good place where we could have some discussion, mid-scale programs. These were recommended by ASTRA 2010, uh, and AST did establish a mid-scale program that in our uh, you know, finding is that it is tremendously, uh, it, it's a great program. It harnesses the creativity, fuels innovation, and really advances a huge range of science. And so we find that this really needs to be expanded with the addition of strategically identified priority areas, again, competed programs, but in areas where we think there's a particular need and uh, maintain the regular open calls. Another big problem here is, you know, the AST program has never really, you know, ASTRO 2010 envisioned a scale of mid-scale uh, project costs from four to a hundred million and none at the higher uh, funding levels have ever been, um, never been approved. And so we think the whole range of scales should be uh, supported and also probably relevant for this group, the sustaining the instrumentation on existing facilities is what keeps them competitive, keeps them at the fore. And so there should be a, a track that uh, advances that. And that's our last view graph. Um, went a little over, but I think we still have 20 something minutes. Uh, this is just a capsule summary of, of the uh, program. Thank you, Fiona and Rob. First of all, thank you for, you know, all the sweat and, you know, blood and tears that went into this report. And as you say, it was more than two years. It's a long, long time you worked at it. So thank you for, on behalf of the whole community, but thank you also for coming and, you know, sharing your thoughts on this today. So we'll have questions. Please use the raise hand feature. And I know that Mark was the first and I will call on Mark now, and then we'll go down the line one by one. So go ahead, Mark. So Fiona, I noticed your background uh, with the stunning image of uh, the supermassive black hole of M87. But I, you know, I, I skimmed the decadal report and uh, it really hardly mentions this dramatic result and it doesn't even really, as far as I could see, consider the NGEHT. So I looked at the individual panel reports and specifically the particle physics and gravitation report. And it basically does not consider imaging supermassive black holes, which I consider kind of odd for a gravitation panel. So do you think the NGHT fell through the cracks between gravitational and radio panels? Well, I, you know, we can't discuss deliberations of the committee. But there, as you say, there was a white paper and every white paper was considered um, by the panel. And the, they, you know, there were a tremendous number of white papers. I think that you could see the numbers were 860 plus total. And so, you know, the things that were emphasized had to be, uh, you know, selective. Yeah. And, and I, I will also just say very quickly, um, there is, you know, I think we actually put this image several places in the report. Um, you know, I don't want to underplay in any way the amazing science here. And, you know, I, I, I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, Mark, you should not worry. Uh, it is, it, it is mentioned in a number, read more closely. Um, as a general rule, we did not call this. This is an example of mid scale. And as a general rule, uh, we did not call out individual because those, you know, ultimately are competed. We, we generally did not want to endorse individual ones by name. You know, we endorsed CCAT in 2010, and that didn't fare very well. Um, but Believe me, it was front and center of, of people's, uh, I mean, again, we can't talk in detail about that, but um, I think, you know, it, it, I'm going to tell you it was a misreading of the report. You should, you know, it, you should be glad, you know, that, that's meant to be uh, very complimentary to you and the project. 
Yeah, and uh, let me just second, you know, I should have said that first. We didn't name by name any mid scale. So any project between four and 120 million, we decided not to name just the same way you don't call out specific explorer missions in space. Um, but if you look, there is a there is a priority area in radio instrumentation that would fit it would fit into uh, very nicely. Okay, so Charles. So I'm actually going to ask a, a, a structural question. Actually, is ten years the right cadence for this process? Because mm. you know, do you want to do it less frequently or more frequently, or is ten years just just about right? Yeah, that's just, a great go ahead, Fiona. Go ahead. I was going to ask. We just well, I, I was going to say that's a great question. You know, when the survey was being instigated, I think NASA was pushing, you know, let's put it off, and NF, NSF was saying, no, we need it now <laughs> because we want to have compelling projects to to sustain our MREFC program uh, funding line. You know, I. This is a personal opinion that's not discussed in the survey, but I think there is value in something like a decadal cadence because decisions will have to be made when we point to a lot of them. For example, we say very clearly, look, here's three large strategic missions to mature, right? They're all incredibly compelling. Here are the targets. And it may be by the end of the decade that the UV OIR large mission has not matured the way uh, envisioned or that it is gonna cost double when you look at it in the detail. In which case we say very clearly, that's why you need to invest a significant amount in the other two because the next decadal may then have, it, have input on which should actually go first. So that would be a, a specific, you know, I'm not saying that would, I hope that doesn't happen, but if it did happen, then they might say, okay, let's let's advance and implement one of these other two while we continue to get the technology and mission for the you know large UVOIR thing under our belt. So that's the kind of cadence we're talking about for these decisions on the large strategic missions. I don't know, Rob, if you have a thought on the ground. Yeah, well, I'll just I think answering it in the general is is fine. The the uh, we tried to take real care not to tie the hands if you stayed with a 10 year cadence uh, to have decision points such that uh, gateways such that uh, the next decadal will have a free hand. Remember, there's always the mid decadal. And I think, if anything, in our planning uh, scenarios, we see that they may have a greater role in the past. I don't think you want to ever go longer than 10, partly for the reasons Fiona gave, that even if the missions, the big things, especially in space, take 20 years, the landscape we work in, you know, uh, the political landscape, the COVID landscape, those change much more rapidly. And uh, think, you know, you could have a whole different world in, in, in 10 years. And that was the challenge for us, right? Our NSF budgets, have an optimistic progression, you know, that was motivated by thoughts of doubling the budget, right? It's the talk in Congress over a decade with almost sort of inflation only as the lower bound. And I think if you stretch things much longer than that, you, you know, you could really uh, find yourself down some wrong paths. You would want some, you know, mid-course correction. And of course, in the middle of the last decade, gravitational waves were discovered, which, we're a major feature in this report. How do you respond to that? How do you uh, advance that? And just a few more words about this maturation program. I mean, the sequence that is in the report really assumes about a decade old cadence because, you know, we're still envisioning NASA prepare the large mission concepts the way they did. The decade will sort of say, okay, these are the ones that are we really like that should have significant investment for maturation. Then the next decade, or, you know, that doesn't work out, you know, some special review would then say, okay, yeah, th this is ready to, to advance, to be adopted by the agencies. 
by the agency. And new things can come in in the next decadal. You know, NASA will do new large mission concept studies, I'm sure, you know, maybe we discover B-mode polarization and they want to do a big, you know, somebody wants to do a big mission to do that. Um, those come in and then they would, if they're compelling, they would enter the maturation program, just like the ones did this, this decade. It's a great question though. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So next, I think Gary. Yes, uh, uh, hi, hi Fiona and hi Rob. Uh, just two points of clarification. I noticed that you mentioned uh, both the uh, far infrared and X-ray missions uh, in the context of uh, strategic missions with $40 million of technology development, uh, but also under the probe line. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you envision or are recommending that uh, both uh, areas proceed as potential strategic and probe missions, uh, or are you more specific uh, regarding how the probe and the strategic missions would play? And, and I had a, a, a second question. Uh, was, the, was the six meter off axis uh, flagship that you ultimately recommended, did that go through a trace cost estimate? I didn't see that. Yeah, I can take those. Um, so it, yeah, it's 40 million a year. So I think it, it over the five years, it's more like 200 million investment in the IR, far IR and, and X-ray, just a clarification. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but you know, why both for a probe and for large mission development, you'll notice the cost target of three to five is, about a factor of two lower than what the estimate, you know, the trace and even the project estimates came up with for the cost. And so some things will have to be, choices will have to be made. And it could well happen that some instrument, let's just take the FAR IR, you know, there's a, an objective that can be met on a probe scale that allows removing an instrument from the large strategic mission and, and making it faster to develop and um, because it, you know, the cost targets lower. So I think they go hand in hand and that's why we, we think there are opportunities for, for both. And on the large UVOIR, we did not do a trace because we did not have a detailed mission concept. What we did as described in the report was sort of a scaling, uh, some of the experts on our panel like Andy Driesman and, and Wanda Segur. Uh, and, and you can read some of the details in chapter seven of, of how that was done. But again, because we're not saying, we're, what we're saying is we think this is feasible at this, it's not a cost cap, It's a, box it's a target and that's what the maturation program has to do go ahead and do and as i said before suppose they find no six meters is really going to cost you 20 billion i think the next survey would you know <laughs> that would not be consistent with what our decadal recommended and the next survey would have to decide if that should go forward or not so there wasn't, yeah, there just wasn't a detailed enough concept to do a trace for that. So you're you imagining that the, the next decadal would be the one to uh, formally bless this, this mission to proceed? Yeah, well, what we say is, you know, we hope it can happen a little bit before the next decadal because we'd love to see this fly in the early 2040s, in which case there would have to be a dedicated review that's similar that looks at the decadal and says, yes, this accomplishes the science and has the reach that the decadal said, and it's consistent with the cost target. And if the answer to any of those is no, then it would have to continue on in maturation. It you know, wouldn't go forward, it wouldn't be adopted. Thank you. So Rob, did you want to add something to that? That's okay. I, I kind of covered it. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, Joan? 
Hi, Rob. Hi, Fiona. Thank, thank you so much for uh, making being here to uh, talk about the report. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the pyramid that you started off the discussion today, uh, which shows the relationship of all the discovery resources in that lovely pyramid shape and has sort of like the foundational and infrastructure resources at the bottom and rising up to the sort of more aspirational elements. I was wondering how you think about the um, do, do you how you think about the pyramid in terms of um, do you think of it as we need to ensure that the lower elements, the foundations are healthy and well supported before ascending to the top? Or more specifically, if we were in a really funding restricted kind of environment, would we make choices using this structure and ensure that the base is well supported before going to the top? Or how do you look at it? Rob, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, I was smiling because we we called it a pyramid ourselves, but I think the artist may have been thinking of a path, a sidewalk, a pathway, you know, so it depends on how you look at it. Um, I think uh, it's a little bit of, it's something in between, Joan. The uh, the example, we showed the example of the MREFC recommendation that before you build uh, some very large new facility, uh, you have to figure out where the dollars, probably 10 years down the road, right, will, will come uh, to, uh, to, to, to build it. And that, and you could, if you take that literally, it says don't build anything new until, you know, th that is a deliberate effort to stop this secular free, uh, squeeze on those foundational programs. So we're trying to issue very strong uh, statements of principle. However, um, it, we I think the way you phrased the question sounded like what we didn't want to do is tie the hands of the agencies and say, until you do every one of these things, right, check all the list, you know, it isn't as if gray takes precedence over the things above it, because especially for things like data infrastructure, some of the state of the profession things were often money comes from sources other than the base astronomy budget and so on. You have to give agencies some flexibility to respond to the year-to-year -year realities, not only of where the money comes from, but whether they have to deal with a continuing resolution or so on. So at least my answer, and Fiona may want to add to this, is yeah, there are very strong statements about the collective investment in foundational elements, but not to be taken uh, too prescriptively. Um, otherwise, you know, they they will uh, not be able to function. I don't. Yeah, I, I may have evaded the question a bit, but that was my attempt. Yeah, I think just briefly, we we state several times in the report that all of these are important for you know advancing the science and so we didn't say we prioritize foundations above you know future uh large missions or observatories or vice versa right and we tried to make that was part of the reason for the phased program of development and decision a decision point and then implementation is that decision point, if things go poorly with budgets, that decision point can get moved out, but we're still making progress. Um, so I think we felt really these are all essential. Um, and, but we certainly emphasize that without the base, you know, <laughs> that's the first step in the pathway is the foundations. Yeah, maybe in terms of specific, this isn't necessarily crippling in the presentation of the ELT program with the shares that were the the NSF bill, annual bill for uh, their share of operations, I think was 32 million or maybe 30, you know, in that range, compared to a current budget of about 300. That's less than Noir Lab, uh, less than Alma and so on. Uh, you know, you consider the time you have to find support for that. Uh, CMBS4 would be much less than that. Uh, 
NGVLA is a real challenge. That's, I think the estimate was $132 million a year. Uh, if you get a partner to pay for a quarter, that reduces it. Of course, if you close, then uh, the VLA, and VLBA, you save some more, but you're still, get, you're talking about, you know, a lot of money, you know, huge uh, shortfall. So it, it depends, uh, you know, on the project. But I don't know, does that answer, does that kind of get to the gist of the question, Joan? I hope so. Yeah, definitely clarifies. Um, I, I just, I think maybe people might wonder about, about that and um, hearing your thoughts uh, really gives it more clarity for me. Thanks so much. Yeah, so actually, Rob and Fiona, maybe I will ask, ask a question following Joan's uh, point. So, you know, you have come up with your recommendations using, I would say, kind of optimistic estimates of what the budget might do. What the agencies told you, you know, this is what we hope can happen. Mm -hmm. So one has to wonder what happens if the money doesn't flow as freely as we hope. And especially if some of these foundational things turn out to be harder to implement than we expected, and they are so important, we have to do it. And there is less money for the upper steps of your ladder. Um, and specifically, I would say the ELTs, right? Your report says we should do both GMT and TMT. NSF should put in so much money, let everything work, everything bloom, et cetera. But if money is tight, a time may come when one may have to choose. And your report has been very careful not to rank GMT and TMT. At least the parts I read, it looked like you're saying, look, just do both of them. Uh, provided they satisfy these minimum requirements. So can you say a little bit about your thinking on that? Because this, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big investment on top of all the other things. And your report could have been a place where something could have been, you know, the tie could have been broken in some sense. You did have decided not to do it. If you have any comments on that. You want me to take it, Fiona? Well, I'll, I'll just give a very, one sentence. If you read the end of the section with the decision rules, there are broad guidelines that say, you know, there's a review that's going to happen. And if, I mean, okay, if one of the projects fails to meet the criteria, then it's clear, right? It don't doesn't go forward. They both meet the criteria and that NSF says, well, it turns out we can only get half the money. Then there's a there's guiding principles for how that review would would balance things. But you know, again, we want to urge the NSF to make every effort. And Rob, I'll let you. I'll turn it over to you. You know, just to finish that, and there is a sentence or two that says, you know, taking into account that that a thirty meter telescope has you know, a bigger aperture, obviously more light collecting, higher diffraction, you know, better diffraction limited performance, but it, but it depends on what's the price, right? Uh, you know, of, of the relative project. So yeah, so those words are in there, but they, you have to read pretty deep into the report. So yes, we do provide some guidance. Overall, Ramesh, remember that the facility construction money comes from a completely different pot. MREFC is an NSF wide program. It's not a tax on uh, the rest of the astronomy budget. So is, you know, to build it is in that sense, if you get the project approved is quote free, but 10 years down the road, seven years down the road, you've got to come up with that. What if it's two telescopes, 25%, that 30 million, whatever it is a year. And we have a recommendation that NSF, uh, go back to, uh, they should embrace senior reviews, essentially portfolio reviews as a way, uh, one of many mechanisms to try to, uh, uh, you know, figure out how to balance it, its investments along the way. So I don't think they're quite as much in conflict as you fear, uh, certainly not in the short term, but we don't want them to punt the can down the road and just say, oh, in 10 years, we'll find the money somewhere. That, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah, I mean, part of what, you know, NSF would like to do, it's this MREFC is a line in the congressional budget that goes up or down as big ships get built for oceanography or telescopes get built for 
astronomy. They will they want to grow that. They want to do more facilities. At least this is what they said to us, and they want to motivate that line going up. But again, as Rob emphasizes, it's not fungible with grants and other things, just because it's a it's a line for construction. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we are past the hour, but you know, I think the discussion is quite interesting. If people are willing to wait and if our uh, visitors are willing to stay on, let's continue with a few more questions, if that is OK. Yeah, and if people need to leave, you're not going to yeah. insult Fiona and me, we understand. Right, yeah. Uh, so I think Nelson Caldwell has his hand up. Yes, hi. Um, change gears here a little bit. Uh, I was interested to see that you, you're you emphasizing uh, for transmitting these plans to graduate students. And uh, I don't know how new that is, but uh, given the length of time for some of these projects, you might also think about elementary schools, of course. But anyway, I, my, my question is, uh, are there concrete plans for distributing some of the plans for these you know, terrific missions uh, to incoming graduate students and uh, undergraduate schools in some you know some kind of brochure fashion that the faculty can distribute and uh, you know is there is there actually a program to do that thanks yeah the the nas usually does produce you know it takes them a while but they do produce a sort of non-expert guide to the survey um they did that for astro 2010 um and so that that is part of their standard practice. Now, does it tar? I think it may target more uh, a lay audience than a incoming graduate student. But yes, yeah, they're um, they're. I think they're going to end up a kind of pamphlet type of thing. But you know, that's already thinking of our generation, Nelson. Right. For yeah. that generation, you target electronically. Yes, exactly. So that website you can go to now, you know, with the pull downs is one step. And uh, there's certainly people thinking about uh, other forms of, so, you know, social media and such as well. But uh, better, you know, they know the details. And that's something we focused okay. on a lot recently. Thanks. So, Gary, I notice your hand is still up. Do you have another question or? You just forgot to load Oh, uh, no, uh, I just didn't take it down. Sorry about that. OK, fine. Then let me call on Pepe. You have to unmute yourself. Hi, yes. Hi, Fiona, Rob. Uh, I was, of course, very pleased that you uh, uh, highlighted as your number one priority the, the new great observatories and, and getting the pre-phase A money to make sure we don't get into a uh, JWST situation again, where the, the, the cost just keeps growing. Um, so the, the, you said there would be cast cost caps for the, the far infrared and X-ray mission, but then I was a little perturbed when you said that the figure for uh, the Planet Finder UV X-ray, uh, UV mission was uh, a target, not a cap. So oh. I misspoke. I'm I wondered, sorry. One, so yeah. one thing was, why is it different, right? And the other one is, how can we be assured that after spending, I think you said eight hundred million dollars for over six years, that it will then be uh, not too big to fail, especially if we haven't done any preliminary work, as it seems to be indicated on the other two uh, new great observatories. Well, so I think there's. Uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke. The report is quite clear for all of them. It's a cost target. So the cost target for X-ray and FAR IR is between three and five. Does that mean five and a half isn't okay? Yeah, I mean, that's consistent with a target. Um, so it's supposed to be the same for all of them. And we say that, you know, several hundred million dollars should also be invested in the coming decade in those two. And it's not a foregone conclusion. You know, what? Can, how can we assure after spending 800 million that 
NASA doesn't ignore our advice to do a serious review for consistency with the cost target and the survey science? Well, we can't, but that's what we intend and we're very clear about it. Um, that, that's all very reassuring. Yeah, and let me say we were, oh, go ahead, Rob. Is that okay? It's gonna get finished, sorry. Oh, no, no, I was just gonna say quickly, we really emphasize that point when we brief the agency. Yeah. You know, that we, we and if you read the language in the report, it's pretty strong. Yeah, and I just, Fiona, I think alluded to this in the, during the presentation. In the scenario you're talking about, Martin, and this, you're right, avoiding another horrendous overruns. And we just, is part and parcel of why we, reasons trying to do this. In the scenario you describe, where costs start spiraling, out of control, I think, you know, what we would hope would come out of this evaluation process is, well, maybe ultimately it's going to cost 20 million to fly you, but you go to the back of the line because you're not going to get done before 2050 at that price. And we're going to fly a couple other large strategic missions in front of you. And that's the stick that kind of goes. Uh, now, whether that plays out, of course, you know, through all the politics and everything, of course, we can't, you know, prescribe but that that if you're asking about intent that's sort of Excellent. Yeah. well in your own panel right came up with not exactly this construct but struggled with the same thing right absolutely uh, you got to do both and if you do them the way that they were put in front of us it's you know 100 years <laughs> it's 20 years <laughs> per right so you know that that's not that's not a good strategy. And you, so you had a particular solution in, in, in your panel report and we, we just, we sort of adopted a general concept just said, well, but let's not decide which science should be done. We just want far infrared and X-ray and not 40 years from now. That's all great. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, you sit, you chose six meters, but I don't know if one of the reasons might have been the rapid development of Starship, which has an eight meter fairing, so you could actually fly a monolithic uh, six meter telescope. That wasn't uh, in the report, but um, interesting to, to chat about it sometime. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. I do not see any other hands raised, but we still have almost 100 people still here. So thank you very much, Fiona and Rob. It, this, is a, you know, this is a big event for us. Thank you for coming here and thank you to everyone who showed up even though today is a holiday. Um, so I think we'll close this session at this point. So bye everyone. <laughs>